Donna. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kim Knox, president of the League of Women Voters of San Diego. It's so exciting to be back here in person with you. It's been three long years since we've had a luncheon at Tom Hams, but I'm so happy to be able to see all your smiling faces. Jane, I will pass it over to you at this point. Thank you, Kim. I just got a call from the chief's assistant. He's five minutes away. There was some construction traffic, but he will be here. So it certainly is nice to see you all in person. Um, gun violence has been racking our country incessantly. Today, the League brings speakers with a depth of knowledge on strategies to address it. After our three speakers are done, we will have question and answer from the audience. Please use the index cards on your table to write questions which a couple of us will collect and will bring up and then Kim will pose the questions. Before our three formal speakers talk, we have Malia Hicks, who is an Aaron Price Fellow, who will briefly give us the view of a senior at Morris High School. We have three high school students, or two high school students here today, who are Aaron Price Fellows as well as their leader, Annie Lyles. Um, so Malia, maybe we'll have you start, and then, we'll, then I'll introduce the others. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon. So I want to begin by first saying how honored I am to be here speaking with a group of individuals who not only understand, but also appreciate the importance of fostering this discussion surrounding gun violence and are also eager to take action to combat these issues. So I want to first thank you for allowing me to share my views on this important issue. So we will learn from our police chief, policy expert, and data expert um, about the statistics surrounding gun violence. But truthfully, there's not many in this room who have had the first-hand experience of growing up in a time when guns are the leading cause of death for children ages 1 through 19 in the U.S. Children, me, captain, kid. So let me tell you what this is doing for us. At school, we're under the constant stress of what could happen, constantly on guard, preparing for the next drill or maybe even not a drill. This year, we had an active shooter drill, which we were not aware was a drill until afterwards. Um, it happened during lunchtime, so almost all of the students were in the quad, which is obviously an outside open area in our school. But I happened to be in the locker room, um, dropping off my friend's equipment for lacrosse. So we're in the locker room, and we hear the, um, the speaker go off, and we're really unsure of how we're supposed to react, what we're supposed to do. We're obviously in the girls' locker room, and their boys start rushing in, like we clo we're closing up the doors, closing all the windows and whatnot. So it's really just a, a very stressful situation. And it really like just threw a wrench in the whole day, even the whole week, because you can't really focus after something like that, whether it's real or not, whether it's an accidental alarm or not, it, it's hard to think about doing calculus after the threat of almost losing your life. And it's, <sighs> I've lost one of my closest friends to gun violence. This year on January 10th, my friend Kiwan Franklin lost his life. And in the event that he lost his life in, there were also two other youth that were injured. The effects of gun violence, there are, there are many. Some are more obvious than others, but there are broken hearts, grief that leaves us hopeless, anxiety and fear surrounding our daily lives. When it's, easy, when it's easier to save, 
sorry, when it's easier and safer to stay home and play video games than go outside or go to school or even go anywhere, what's the rational decision? What choice are we going to make? With more kids being killed by guns than ever, we need to look at what's changed. Adults should be taking care of children. Teens like me and Captain, we are here to share our experiences, but also to help offer some solutions, like restorative practices, restrictions on gun ownership, teaching healthier, safer ways to, to solve conflict, and being aware of warning signs for suicide. I understand that this is a very controversial topic, and it is also very complex, so it's unrealistic to expect major progress overnight. But it's my life that's at stake, my learning that's impacted, my friends, your kids, grandkids that are growing up in a life full of fear that honestly no other generation has faced. I honestly haven't fully found a solution, but I know that we should allow our criminal justice system to do its job. I also know that gun violence is preventable. There's a quote that I live by, by Dr. Mae Jemison, the first black woman astronaut. It says, never be limited by other people's limited imaginations. So today, please join me in imagining a childhood free from the lo constant looming fear of gun violence. We as young people are counting on you to prepare and prevent gun violence before it occurs. But you're not alone. We're here to help. powerful words. So, I would like to introduce our three speakers. We're delighted to have you. David Hernandez is a reporter for the San Diego Union Tribune who covers law enforcement, crime, and public safety across San Diego County. He's a graduate of San Diego State University and joined the Union Tribune staff in 2015. And he will focus on gun use in San Diego and community-led efforts to address it, ad address gun violence. Chief David Nislin has been chief of the San Diego Police Department since 2018. He joined the police department in 1988. He's a native of San Diego, and his father was also a police officer. And he will speak on some of the proactive police work in San Diego. Therese Heimer has led the legislation and advocacy team at San Diegans for Gun Violence Prevention for the past five and a half years. She has a JD from Stanford and has worked in employment law and hu human resources consulting for many years. She will focus on some key policy initiatives and challenges. So David, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Hernandez, and I have been with the Union Tribune for about seven and a half years now, most of that time covering public safety, which includes, honestly, quite a bit of things, including um, wildfires, crime, policing issues. Uh, it runs the gamut. Um, obviously here to talk about gun violence today, and um, there's a lot to this topic, and I've tried to condense it into hopefully the most impactful things that I've um, covered. Um, I wanted to start off with some statistics. Um, every year the Union Tribune takes a look at um, homicides from the previous year. And we're actually doing that currently for 2022. Um, so I'm gonna pull some statistics from the story that we did last year. Um, there were 118 homicides in San Diego County in 2021, including 57 in the city of San Diego. And nearly three of every five cases, or about 60%, involved a gun. And that actually mirrors um, a national trend, so we're not alone in that. Um, many other cities, small and large, are seeing that uh, gun violence is driving homicide numbers. 
And it's also not necessarily a new uh, trend, um, but there have been recent increases in, uh, in recent years. Um, so for example, in 2016, of all homicides in San Diego County, 40% involved a gun. And again, that's now closer to 60%. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about you know, what's behind the problem, and obviously there's a lot to it. Um, but I wanna fo focus on two areas um, that really, it, bo it boils down to the fact that there are a lot of guns on the streets and in homes. So first off, um, one of the big issues are uh, ghost guns. And um, I know the chief can talk a little bit more about this, but essentially they are guns that um, are built by hand, often at home, and usually they are made from parts that come in prepackaged kits. And uh, one of the big issues with that is that whenever someone buys gun parts, they don't have serial numbers on the parts, um, only really um, assembled firearms require a serial number. So when people build these guns at home, under law, once it's completed, it's required to have a serial number. But oftentimes, anyone who's wanting to circumvent law, um, perhaps someone who isn't allowed to have a gun, um, won't uh, get that serial number. And uh, police have noted that it's very hard to trace where these guns come from. And then the other issue is that, uh, that of gun sales. So at the start of the pandemic, we saw a, an uptick. Um, and I actually went out to gun stores at the time. We, we had realized that there, was a lot of, there were a lot of people lining up, quite literally, out the door and uh, seeking guns. And just to take you back to that moment a little bit, you might remember there was a lot of fear about what would happen. So a lot of the people that I spoke to really pointed to that, not knowing if there was gonna be chaos um, or what. So uh, gun owners did say that they, they were w witnessing unprecedented numbers in terms of uh, clientele. And um, that, that trend has continued um, since, since the start of the pandemic. Um, and I do want to point out that um, oftentimes the majority of cases we see um, are, at least when we know the circumstances, are driven by either um, gangs or domestic violence. Uh, those are really two big factors within that. And also, by and large, um, we see a lot of violence in um, concentrated in communities that lack resources. So oftentimes these are communities um, of color who, again, either lack job opportunities, after school programs for children to keep them busy. And um, often when you talk to activists, they point to that, uh, that notion, um, given that you know, if, if, if we wanna tackle the root of the problem, um, they would say, you know, these communities need attention in terms of, again, for lack of a better word, resources. Um, and now I wanna focus a little bit on community-led efforts. Um, there are a lot of organizations doing work on this issue. Um, one of them is a group that uh, essentially are known as uh, Credible Messengers, and they are former gang members who have turned their life around and work in the community, especially after shootings, um, and, and they really try to interrupt and disrupt that violence to prevent retaliatory shootings, for example. And that happens um, in various different ways. That might unfold um, in a hospital by seeking out the victim of that shooting and trying to talk to them to convince them, take that opportunity to convince them to turn their life around. And uh, that also involves offering them resources. So um, housing, if that is necessary, um, job support, um, a lot of different resources to, again, 
hopefully convince them to leave, leave that um, lifestyle behind. They also often talk to the gang members themselves. They are, again, as I mentioned, known as credible messengers because they feel that the message is best received um, when it's coming from someone who used to uh, be involved in, in the violence, really, and, and gangs. So they will try to convince people to stop um, and not retaliate and, in, 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 again, prevent further shootings. Um, and, and this really has been work that's been going on for a while. Um, more recently, we have seen um, what has already been happening in other cities, which is the city throwing support behind this effort and partnering more closely with these community-led groups. Um, so whereas other, uh, other cities um, have a more structured program that partners city staff and these community members who have been doing the work. Um, we haven't seen that so much in San Diego until more recently. And um, again, through uh, various programs, um, one of them is the No Shots Fired program, which again is largely trying to connect um, gang members with resources, um, with the support of the city. Um, and, and when I talk about support, a lot of it has to do with financial support, giving these communities the money that they need to do the work. Um, and the city recently received a grant that will allow it to provide more money to these organizations and perhaps even partner with them more closely by having city staff, city employees working more directly with these organizations. Um, and um, I started with the statistics, but I wanted to make sure I captured um, the story of a family impacted by gun violence. You know, as part of my work, I try to obviously focus on the statistics. They tell a story without a doubt, but also try to focus on the families that have been impacted. So um, I just want to read a brief um, excerpt from a story that I wrote last year. It was actually the story that looked at homicides from the previous year. Um, it's not too long, so bear with me. Ever since a stray bullet killed 12-year-old Angel Gaspar Gallegos last year, the 25th day of each month reminds his family they still have no answers. Angel was killed last Thanksgiving on November 25th. He was in his family's backyard in the Skyline neighborhood when a bullet pierced a fence and struck him in his back. Where the bullet came from and who fired the round remains a mystery. Quote, every 25th is another month that we know nothing, said one of his aunts, Maria Gaspar, re referring to the still unsolved case. It's just frustrating and hurtful, she said. With Thanksgiving around the corner at the time, uh, the one year anniversary of Angel's death will be difficult to navigate, his aunt said. The holiday is tainted and the grief continues. For months after the shooting, Gaspar used her voice to call attention to the case, joining other community members at events that highlighted the issue of gun violence. Eventually, though, she had to take a step back. It just consumed me, she said. She realized, she said, that she had delayed the grieving process because, quote, I was so dedicated and angry and wanted everyone to hear everything we were going through the pain and the hurt and the damage it cost us. She still hears Angel's laugh sometimes. He was a well-mannered and kind boy, the youngest of three children in his family. A month ago, as Gaspar packed for a getaway, a cruise, she found the outfit she wore last Thanksgiving, a black and silver sequin dress. It was my glam dress, she said. I felt beautiful in it, and now I have an ugly memory from it a memory of a tragedy she still hasn't processed. Quote, it just sent me back, she said. It reminded me that I'm still grieving. Um, and that's all. Thank you very much for your time.
how's everybody doing? Everybody can you hear me good? So it's, it's truly an honor to be here today. I think shortly after I became chief in March of 2018, I think we were in a different room where I was talking to you folks about gun violence. And I wish I had better news, but it hasn't gotten any better, folks. And just want to talk about some of the things that we're seeing, some of the trends that we're seeing um, nationally, kind of expand on a couple of things that, that Dave was talking about, ghost guns, um, gun violence, where we're seeing some trends. I am happy to tell you in 2022, we did see a decline in homicides compared to 21, um, but we saw an increase in armed robberies involving firearms and aggravated assault, meaning someone got shot, but they did not die. We saw that increase. So there's some disturbing trends, there's some good trends. Um, I think you know this, Dave. I'm presenting uh, crime stats tomorrow, I think at 1115. Um, and so you'll hear a lot of this, but what I want to talk about first and foremost is thank you. I want to thank David for bringing up the Angel case, Angel Gaspar. Uh, it is near and dear to my heart. Um, I spent 35 years, north of 35 years on this police department. Um, and so you can imagine I've worked in quite a few different divisions and teams. Part of that was homicide. Um, obviously I was the chief of police for this case on Thanksgiving. We are still doing a lot of work in that. Uh, the sad part for me is we had technology that would have given us at least a starting point of where that round came from, and unfortunately that technology was taken away. Um, and so that's the aggravating part for me uh, because I believe every victim of homicide has a right to have the person that is responsible to be held accountable and to give that cl uh, family closure. And in this case, it's going to be very difficult because in every single homicide case, we have a jump off point. We know where where the crime occurred. We know Angel was in his backyard. The round pierced the, the, uh, the wooden fence, but we don't know where that was fired from. There is a canyon right there, so it's a very difficult case, but I wanna let you know it is something we are still actively working and will continue to work. Um, wanna to talk to you first and foremost, I wanna just talk about a couple of the trends that we see, some good, some bad. Um, and this kind of goes in with the credible messengers. Um, believe it or not, back in 2012, I was then a lieutenant in the gang unit, and we started working with credible messengers. Um, and as a gang lieutenant, anytime we had a gang-related shooting, whether it be a homicide or a shooting where the person survived, I would then call a, a person by the name of Bishop Bowser, who was one of the credible messengers, and I would give him just some basic information. Who was involved victim side, who was involved suspect side, and what hospital they went to. Um, and their job was to get in front of the retaliatory acts. Because if you understand how gangs work, if Skyline rolls, that's, I'm just talking cop stop, if they roll and shoot um, West Coast Crip, I can guarantee you West Coast Crip is not gonna take kindly to that and they're going to retaliate. So when we started doing that in 2012, we were able to see the gang violence and the gang homicides decline rapidly. I am still here to tell you that we're not seeing a major spike in gang-related homicides. And in fact, the last year, this is something I keep track of, last year we had six uh, gang-related homicides. The year before, we had 17. So we're still doing a lot of work, but it ebbs and flows, folks. We had a ton of gang-related shootings. Dave, you probably remember this, where it was going back and forth. They even stole some headstones from some grave sites um, as kind of a way to mock the other gang. Um, but we were able to get in front of that. And one of the ways that we've been able to get in front of some of this gang violence is also targeting those that we know are shooters within those gangs. We've done large scale operations from Operation Mic Drop. This is all stuff that David's reported on. Um, scrap Busters um, and a couple others. We've got another one coming up, Dave. Maybe we can talk after this. Um, maybe I'll give you the, the exclusive on this. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're doing a lot of large-scale operations where we're working very closely with both our state, our local, and our federal partners to target those who are targeting our communities. Um, and that is really working and taking some of these cases to the federal side versus the state side. But let me talk about one of the biggest issues that we've seen, and David touched on it briefly, and that is ghost guns. Um, and so when we started, we were the first agency to really start tracking how we're recovering ghost guns. I think we were the first department in the nation to really track ghost guns. 
We saw in 2018, we had a, just a handful. Um, by 2021, we had close to 250, I believe. I forget the exact numbers, but I think that's about right. Right now, we're recovering about every 20 to 25% of all guns that we recover are ghost guns. Why that's critical is because most of those and the guns that we're recovering are from prohibited persons. And when I talk about prohibited persons, I'm talking about a convicted felon or I'm talking about somebody who by court has been diagnosed with mental illness and not allowed to purchase or own a firearm, okay? We are also the first department to that I'm aware of that started their own ghost gun apprehension team. And so when we get a ghost gun out in the street, um, our ghost gun will do a follow-up to figure out where they're getting this product from. They created, this has created a very niche market of people making, manufacturing, and selling guns. Um, and this is the case I want to give you, Dave. It, we'll, you'll hear about it in the coming days, but we had a very big seizure Sunday night of ghost guns. Came across a lab. I don't know if you saw Escondido a couple of days ago also had that one being manufactured out of an RV. Our case was from a home, but we're talking high numbers of guns being manufactured, high number of guns being um, recovered by us just this past Sunday. It is still an issue. Now, the silver lining in this is last August 24th, the federal government closed the loophole. So ghost guns typically or technically are no longer legal to be sold via the internet and the mail. So, yeah, that's a good thing. And, and let me explain how this was allowed to be. So the legal definition of a firearm is really the lower, where the trigger assembly is. That is where the serial number is. So were they able to determine because the gun was only 80% completed, it was not a firearm. It did need, not meet the legal requirement to be considered a firearm until you did certain things. And you generally, for a handgun, had to make about four to five drill holes uh, where you could put the trigger assembly in, you could clean out the breech, you'd have to drill that part out because it was solid, allowing the slide and all the mechanisms to come in. Anybody with a little bit of skill, a drill, you don't even need a drill press because they gave you a jig, 30 to 35 minutes from the time this gun arrives at your door, you have a fully functioning, non-traceable firearm. But it didn't just stop with handguns, folks. It also is assault rifles. Same thing with assault rifles. So you can go on any internet site and you can buy a barrel and the, the, what you call the foregrip and everything else for an assault weapon. The only thing you couldn't buy would be the lower receiver. Well, ghost guns decided to make lower receivers. You do the same thing, you drill out, you drill out where the mag goes. Uh, and about 45 minutes, you have a fully functioning AR-15 AK-47. We have seen these guns be used in crimes. Uh, I'll take you back to the summer of 2018, Rolando, not far from San Diego State, where we had two San Diego police officers shot uh, on a radio call. That was a machine gun, that was a ghost gun. Uh, if you look at the mass shooting that we had a couple of years ago in the gas lamp, where they shot the five people, including the valet that he killed immediately, that was a ghost gun handgun. We've had multiple, multiple, very high profile crimes committed by persons who were prohibited from owning a firearm we're using a ghost gun. The, the sad part about this is we're going to see the number of ghost guns still being proliferating our communities because there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of ghost guns in our communities. It's going to take time to get rid of these, uh, to be quite honest with you. Um, Want to talk about the other trend. So good news is gang crime went down where we saw more gun-related homicides and homicides in general was, and I'll separate them, family violence and domestic violence. Um, and we're, we've seen somewhat, and I'm sure David, you've seen that too, a slight increase in the family related homicides. And when I mean family, I'm not talking intimate partners, I'm talking about generally kids killing their parents. Um, and so, you know, we've seen that quite a bit. One of the most horrific cases that I've ever worked in homicide was a case involving a daughter killing her mother. Um, but I just want to talk about some of the other proactive things we're doing besides the ghost gun apprehension team, besides working with our federal partners. We also do gun buybacks. 
Um, and most of those guns are n never would ever be used in a crime, but folks, they're getting them out of the community. Where we are finding, besides getting ghost guns, where most people who are used using guns for violence get their firearms from, is from houses and cars. Um, and it's, it's people not being responsible in securing their firearms. Believe it or not, more from cars than homes, um, but still it's the, bo it's the best. You know, so what I'm asking for you folks is if you're going to own a firearm and that is your right and that is your own decision, I'm asking you to be responsible in making certain that you secure your firearm. Because again, we are seeing people breaking into cars and getting guns. I read incident logs every single week. When I read in a home was broken into, a business was broken into, a home, I mean a house a car was broken into, and some of the seized items or one of the items that they found was a firearm. Um, and so that then goes out to the public. Um, and we're just seeing, for instance, last night, my uh, gang unit stopped one car, four individuals, three of them armed. This is a daily occurrence in the city of San Diego, folks. Uh, we are coming across more and more people armed on a daily basis than we've ever in my 35 years. Um, and I come from a law enforcement family, as they said. My father was on the job from the 60s to 1999. I've got a little mini-me running around. My son works Central Division. He's been on the job for five years. He's seen more guns over the last couple of years in the street. Um, and so... If we can all work together and remove the firearms from the public or from those that wish to do us all harm, we need to for these two. And it's tough to follow you, by the way. <laughs> uh, that's a tough, you did phenomenal, by the way. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, it's about our young people. They deserve better, quite frankly. Uh, and I'll wrap this up, but I had the opportunity to speak to about 50 high school juniors and seniors um, just a couple weeks ago at my police station. This was the day after the national shooting. And I asked these kids, I turned it around. They generally ask questions of me. I was able to ask questions of them. How much do they think about their safety while they sit in school? And it was heartbreaking, folks. They're deathly afraid of being a victim of violence in their own schools. And it didn't matter if it was North County, Point Loma High School, San Diego High, Morris, down to the south. They all felt it. They all think about it on the daily basis. And quite frankly, folks, we owe our kids better. They should be sitting in those seats, being worried about what they can learn and what is their future, not about their safety. <laughs> and with that, I will wrap it up. Well, I'm very pleased to be here representing San Diegans for Gun Violence Prevention. Let me just tell you briefly about us. We are a coalition of 16 different organizations. So some of those are national groups that I'm sure you're familiar with the name of, Moms Demand Action, Brady United. Um, some are uh, youth organizations, and the power of our youth was so well uh, shown to all of us today, right, with Malia speaking to us. Uh, they are the future of our movement, but we all need to be doing what we can now. Uh, some of our members of our coalition are local community-based organizations, the type of organizations that David was talking about, doing the work on the ground. And we also have faith communities. So we advocate for laws, we educate, and we support our community. And so, um, the other thing that we do that I won't have to mention while I'm here, the League of Women Voters, is that we name gun violence prevention candidates. And so in 2024, as we go back into the election, we focus on our local candidates. And so you can know to look at our website and see what um, we are saying about some of our candidates and their support, their important support for gun violence laws. Um, so. Uh, we've talked about how guns are the number one cause of death among our children. And the thing that I think all of you in this room are probably most familiar with are mass shootings. And uh, mass shootings need attention, and that attention drives change. So think about it. 
The Parkland school shooting five years ago where 17 uh, students and staff members lost their lives. Out of that grew the youth movement of March for Our Lives. Um, and the tragedy at Covenant School in Tennessee just last month, did all of you see some of the video of it? They had students marching into the state capitol from all different angles, from Vanderbilt, from uh, Belmont University, from high schools, converging on the state capitol saying, you have to do something about this. So the attention on mass shootings is important. It can lead to change. In Parkland, it led to a gun violence restraining order type of law, um, emergency risk protection law. I thought the chief might talk about that, so I'll... I was hoping that would be a question so I can get into that. Okay. Um, I'll just quickly say they are laws that um, if you or someone knows uh, of a person who is a danger to themselves or others, you can go to law enforcement and uh, get their help to get a restraining order to have the person's guns taken away and to prevent them from getting future guns. The city of San Diego has done a tremendous job. There's a good partnership before the city, between the city attorney and the police department on gun violence restraining orders. And so the fact that it happened in Florida, the fact that the Republican governor of Tennessee is now talking about needing that type of law, they're also sometimes called red flag laws, um, those are important changes. They're driven by mass shootings, but what percent of shooting deaths gun deaths each year do you think mass shootings are? It's only one to two percent of the shootings. And so we need to talk about this much more broadly. So let's talk just a little bit um, about uh, other types of violence. So one of the challenges of going third is which parts of your talk have they already been talked about by other people? <laughs> so uh, I left so the GBRO. <laughs> yes, yes, so bear with me just a little bit. Um, so. Besides mass shootings, there is uh, what is sometimes called daily gun violence or community violence. It's already been talked about a lot by our first two speakers. And I do want to um, thank the city of San Diego for going to the state to get this large um, grant of $3.65 million that's coming into our community to address uh, this type of violence in particular. And that's under a grant called CALVIP stands for California Violence Intervention and Prevention. And um, so that's an important additional funding into our community. Okay, so mass shootings, community violence, domestic violence, that's already been talked about. Do you know the presence of a gun in domestic violence situations increases the risk of homicide by 500%. 500%. And there's another link that's important, and it's that's the link between mass shootings and domestic violence. 60% of mass shootings between 2014 and 2019 were linked to domestic violence. And that's in two different ways. Some of it is the shootings themselves that are mass shootings are domestic violence. You know, the chief was talking about family shootings. There are often um, mass shootings where an entire family is taken out by one of their members. Uh, the other way there's a link is there's a very strong link between mass shooters and having a history of domestic violence, even if their victims are totally random at the time that they um, do the mass shooting. So domestic violence is important, and having resources to provide aid are important, and we've got good resources in our county. In the city, there is a family justice center called um, Your Safe Place. Up in North County, there is Our Safe Place. They help victims of domestic violence, of human trafficking, of hate crimes. So if you know somebody who needs help in those areas, know that there are resources in our city. Okay, another type of gun violence, unintentional shootings. Two children are playing. There's a gun and a gun's off, gun goes off, for example. Unintentional shootings. But we still haven't talked about the major uh, cause of gun death. So what haven't I talked about? Suicide. Suicide. So nationally, 60% of gun deaths are uh, death by firearm, suicide. And here in San Diego, it's higher. It's at least 66%. 
given our statistics that we can see. And why is that? Um, part of it may be our heavy military and vet presence because they are considered at higher risk of suicide. Um, so with all these types of violence, it's important to look at what are the root causes of that type of violence and what are the right solutions for that type of violence. And David already talked um, really well about some of the issues with community violence in under-resourced communities and the importance of getting them certain types of programs. And the chief urged you to think about secure storage. And I just wanna reiterate that because it is an example of a solution that covers so many different types of gun violence. If we can convince people who own guns to securely store them. So California has a law and it only applies to children in households. It's called a child access prevention, or CAP law, I can't remember what the P stands for. Um, so what San Diego realized is that leaves a lot of holes to only be addressing guns in households with children. And so in 2019, the, state, uh, the city of San Diego and then three other cities up the coast put in place secure storage laws the county put in place a law last year. And so that law is broad and it says all gun owners shall store their guns locked. It either has to have a trigger lock or be in a safe unless it is in their possession or in their immediate control, like right there, immediate control. It has to be locked other than that. And so think about all the different types of violence that are addressed by that. Um, it addresses unintentional shootings, it addresses teen suicide, it can even impact adult suicide for a gun to be locked because those seconds that you have to take to unlock your gun can end up saving a life because it can interrupt the suicidal ideation that is going on. And very, very importantly, it addresses the theft issue the chief was talking about. So. He's already made the ask that I was going to store your guns locked, but also please, those of you who are parents and who are grandparents, think about when your kid is going to another house. For young people, when you are going to visit a friend, it is a question that we have to normalize. Asking the parent or asking your friend when you're a teen, if there is a gun in the house, is it locked? It's such an important question. So, those are things you can do, and we're gonna go back to what you can do at the end of my talk. Um, but I also wanna talk to you a little bit about one other thing happening in San Diego County. They are working on a gun violence reduction project. In April of 2022, the County Board of Supervisors asked for staff to do a community needs assessment and then to develop specific intervention to address the different types of gun violence that go on in the county. That report, I think, is going to be coming out in June. And so my hope is that one of the recommendations will be that the county looks at the incredible model that has been set up on gun violence restraining orders in the city where people who are a danger to themselves or others, the firearms are being removed, and the county gets on board much more than they have been because we don't see that there are many GVROs being issued in the county outside of the city of San Diego, unfortunately. So I hope that will change. So I'm gonna shift gears completely and talk a little bit about good news. The good news at the state level is that California has the strongest gun laws in the country. Yeah. And that's important, it translates to uh, the eighth lowest rate of gun deaths. And so the laws are doing a good job at protecting us at some level, which is good. But the bad news is that the more guns you have, the more gun violence you have. And that has been proven up in study after study after study. And as David said, gun sales have been increasing dramatically. Do you know there's over 400 million guns in the United States? That's more than people, right? Okay, so we've got a gun problem. 
The second bad news issue is changes in Supreme Court law about gun regulations. So, in 2008, for the first time in a case called Heller, the court decided that uh, the Second Amendment protects a law-abiding citizen's right to possess a handgun in their home for self-defense. So that had a certain standard set up under it. We were used to operating under it. We were still able to get good, solid gun regulations and laws in place. Last year, the Supreme Court decided a case called Bruin, and they found for the first time about that there was also a right to bear arms in public for self-defense. So what it did was it struck down New York's law on concealed carry weapons. It's back. Um, and uh, it had what's called a May issue law where there was subjectivity about when uh, permits would be issued for concealed carry. So it struck that down. And by the way, California has a May issue, same standard. The problem is not that, because you can put in place, and the court specifically said you can put in place what are called shall issue laws. Um, and so you can still have a permitting system. But the problem is they stated a new test. And the new test is that governments must show its gun law to be consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. It's having a huge impact. All kinds of new lawsuits are being filed. And courts are struggling to regulate our modern guns and their incredibly deadly firepower looking at laws from the 1700s and 1800s to try to find an analogous law. So what's going on is that there are gonna be battles to try to get a balance between Second Amendment gun rights and rights to life, liberty, safety, and more. And the cases that were pending um, last year before the Ninth Circuit have now been sent back down to district court um, they're with a couple of important cases about um, high capacity magazines that are used in mass shootings and assault weapons are now back with a district judge in San Diego, Judge Benitez. And uh, the impact of this decision is shown also just two weeks ago, Judge Sabra here in San Diego totally flipped his decision when he went back to look at it under the new Bruin standard. And he struck down parts of California's longstanding Unsafe Handgun Act, um, including some really important things related to microstamping that I'll talk about more in a minute. So it's a surreal place to be right now. Uh, the courts are trying to sort it through, and it's leading to a lot of difficult decisions, including a domestic violence case, not in our Ninth Circuit here, um, but it was a domestic violence case that held that you couldn't remove guns from a, a person who had been convicted of domestic violence because there were no domestic violence laws back in the 17 and 1800s. So, you know, obviously the large gu uh, gun violence prevention organizations across the country are fighting this and they're working hard on uh, the lawsuits. So my final point, I just want to talk about a little bit about California laws that are working their way through the legislature. We can't begin to scratch the surface. There are more than 40 gun-related laws uh, pending in the legislature right now. Um, and so I'm going to talk very quickly just about three. One of them is Senate Bill 2 and the League of Women Voters. Um, I said to Kim and to Jane the other day, I said, if, if the League of Women Voters has backed one guy, gun violence prevention law of all that 40 plus, it's got to be Senate Bill 2. And guess what? The League of Women Voters is supporting this bill. So it is the bill that corrects California's uh, gun licensing, concealed carry weapon licensing system to comply with the Bruin Supreme Court decision. So it sets objective standards for the permitting to happen, and it also increases training requirements, and it also um, creates safe spaces where guns can't be carried even if you have a concealed carry weapon license. So places like bars and schools and the courthouse and when we go to vote. Okay, 
Um, the second law I want to mention is AB 28. Um, it is a small tax on firearm and ammunition sales. Uh, it would provide a permanent funding stream for the CalVIP grants to provide the type of intervention work that David talked about. And then the final bill I want to mention is uh, Senate Bill 452, which is a microstamping bill. And it, uh, it is authored by our local Senator Blakespear, who um, we are so glad to have in the uh, legislature now at the state level. So uh, Senator Blakespear's office uh, put onto the table these little cards. She is uh, author of three different gun violence prevention bills, including the microstamping bill, which who knows what future it has under the Supreme Court decision, but it's trying to close some important loopholes in the law that still exists now on microstamping. And there's a little error on the uh, sheet, so if you want to mark on it, if you want to uh, be able to follow it, it's actually Senate Bill 452. So what can you do to help um, with gun violence besides the safe storage that we already talked about. On your table you'll see a sheet like this. I hope you will take them. Uh, one of the things you can do is join our organization and there are two ways you can do that. On this sheet I give you our website and that is by far the best way to go ahead and join us. You go home and you can look for the join button down at the bottom of the home page, sign up. You can choose your level of involvement. You can just get our newsletters. Or you can decide this is a area that you're passionate about, like I am, and decide to volunteer. You can donate. There's so many things you can do at all different levels. Um, if you would rather go the old school way, after I finish talking, Lori, who is also with our organization, is gonna pass around some sheets and you can just sign up and we'll get you onto our email list. There are other ideas listed here and the hard thing about handing out hard copy is there are ridiculous links <laughs> that are really long that you are never gonna type in. So down at the bottom of the page is our very brief email, message, uh, email address and you can just email us and say, I'd like the soft copy of this that got handed out at the League of Women Voters and we will send it to you, and then you can just hit the links if one of these other things interests you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you all for such an informative discussion. I would like, uh, people are going around collecting cards with questions, and while they're doing that, we have here Francine Busby, who is from Senator Blakespear's office. Is there anything you'd like to add about some of her work? Thank you. Well, I am the author of the typo. I own it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, but we did want to get these done yesterday and get them here today. Um, just a couple things. One is, you know, Senator Blakespear offered me to introduce uh, these bills on day one when she went to talk and went to uh, tell Sacramento. These are, this is a really important issue for her. So one of the other uh, bills that she's introducing is gun violence, uh, gun violence insurance. It's really uh, would require that gun owners own insurance so in case that gun is used to injure, damage, or uh, you know, kill somebody, that there is insurance to help cover the cost of damage uh, as much as you can in a situation like that. It's really an introductory concept because it doesn't exist. Insurance companies, I don't think, have it yet. And the discussion is going on, but it's a really good discussion to have. You know, we've been talking about registering guns like we register cars forever, and it's still not necessarily the law in every state. So like that, this is something that we know she's introducing. The other one came about because Moms Demand Action, actually with Nancy Herndon, who's right here, came in and talked about putting up sort of disclaimer signs in uh, gun stores. And so the senator thought that was a great idea, and Nancy said, well, we're gonna do it regionally. She said, no, we're gonna do it around the whole state. That is Senator Blakespear. So she took it, and she and Nancy went back and forth with their staff. So now she has a bill for gun store warning labels, and I think we found that they do have warnings, but they put them on the ceiling. <laughs> which I think is their message to what they think of those warning um, disclaimers. 
And so now they, I think that they tailored this to say that these warning labels need to be in a place where people can actually read them and see them. So anyway, uh, that's, uh, those are the three that I put on here, and I just want to thank you all for having me today. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for the amazing speakers for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Thank you. I had one meeting that was canceled, so I could stay a little longer. Okay, but we're going to wrap up by 1.45 at the latest. All right, thank you. Um, we do have a lot of questions here, so I'll get right to it. Police in schools haven't helped stop shootings in schools. What is being done to bring more restorative justice and counseling to stop bullying and decrease violence in schools? I think that's a great question for David. <laughs> no, no, no. I can take it. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I know there's been a lot more of a focus on mental health in schools than before, at least in some schools. I don't know that it's been across the board, um, but yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I can only speak for San Diego. We do have a presence on a lot of the campuses. San Diego Unified School District has their own police department. Um, upon us, I have school safety patrol officers that are more in the elementary and the middle schools. Um, but with that said, they're not there every minute of the day, every single hour. And if you remember during the George Floyd, the calls for police reform, that was one of the big asks was to remove law enforcement from campuses, uh, which I actually thought was very short-sighted. That's where we build a relationship with our youth. Um, that's where we actually can do some recruiting, but also there's that level of safety um, and so I think, I think it's a balance. I do believe that law enforcement does have and should have a presence on the campus uh, for safety purposes. But I'll go back to my previous comments. I, I really want kids focused on learning and not on their safety. You know, you see schools in other, other states that have, they have to go through metal detectors and everything like that. I don't think that is really a great environment for learning quite frankly. So I think there's other things that can be done to, to harden our schools without the magnetometers and all the other things. But I do think it's a conversation that continue needs to be had uh, because, you know, we see it almost every week. I mean, you know, going back to obviously what happened in Uvalde to what just happened in Nashville. Uh, and then sadly, we'll be hearing about another case probably this week or next week because history shows that it will. And it's just, it's just what it is. I mean, so that's kind of my short answer to a, a comment there. If I could add to that, um, the person who asked this question is right. You know, the reality is, is that even some of our major mass shootings that have happened at schools, there have been school resource officers there, and one person can't prevent mass shootings with these types of weapons. And so what else can we do? And the question asked about restorative justice and it is an important idea. And I don't know how many of you in the room have heard about an organization in town called TKF, the Tariq Kamisa Foundation. Uh, they are one of our local wonderful resources. They have programs in some of our schools. They tend to focus on the middle school level because of the history of the organization. It was founded by uh, the grandfather and the father of uh, a young 14-year-old who shot and killed a young college-age pizza delivery um, man here in town. And they go into middle schools and they teach a type of restorative justice. They do healing circles. And it's about building the skill set. I think David was talking about this a little bit. For people to be able to resolve conflict without violence. And so I think that's an important type of program to expand more and more in our schools. Thank you. What are the difficulties in enforcing state safe storage laws? Has anyone been convicted for not following safe storage laws? <laughs> I'm in the business of arresting people. I don't prosecute people. So, um, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, the safe storage, when I look at the safe storage laws, I think either Teresa or somebody else mentioned it, it was really geared around kids. And if I remember right, this came after a case of two kids playing in a storage facility. 
they found a gun in his residence and kept getting shot. So I, I'm not aware of any prosecution on the, the safe gun ordinance yet, but I would not be the person to ask. I think that would need to come from the city attorney or district attorney. Um, I ask this question of the city attorney's office about once a year. And uh, <laughs> the reality is that um, even at the time the law was being put into place, uh, city attorney Mara Elliott made it clear that the purpose of the law is education. It's to tell people the importance of securely storing your firearm and that she was much less focused on arrests and uh, then prosecuting people than on just having people learn to use, or use proper storage. Thank you. How well are gun violence restraining orders working in San Diego? Um, to me, so the gun violence restraining order, um, I actually know quite a bit about this. In 2016, I was the patrol chief, um, and we did a pilot along with the city attorney. I was involved in the inception of this program in our Eastern Division to really target those that are owning guns that are exhibiting uh, behaviors of violence. And so when you look at the gun violence restraining order, my department along with the city attorney, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal relationship. Um, just to give you some numbers, and I don't have the raw numbers, but I'm gonna give you a percentage. And last year, late last year, the Attorney General, Rob Bonta, came to San Diego. We are the model for the state. We are doing right now 30% of all gun violence restraining orders in this state. Wow. Um, yeah. So we are leading the way. Um, in fact, this morning, I came in at about 6.30, I got into the office and my sergeant that's involved in the gun violence restraining order was getting ready to drive up to LA County to teach another department the gun violence restraining order. We are leading the way, we go along with the city attorney and we present to all the cities and we get them on board. I truly believe this is one of the best tools that we've seen in a long, long time of removing firearms from the public that we believe are going to be used to harm somebody. Right. We also use them in domestic violence situations. And the one reason why we chose to start doing that versus the domestic violence restraining order aspect of the guns is it's immediate. It flags the person. So previously a person by restraining order under the domestic violence could with lapse go to a gun store the following day, purchase a gun, wait the period because it wouldn't come through yet. Gun violence hits the system immediately um, once we get it. So it prevents the person from legally going to purchase another firearm. That's why I like it for that aspect. Uh, but it is a phenomenal tool. Uh, we actually just recently got a grant to help offset some of the employment or the cost. So we're gonna be increasing our size of our gun violence restraining order unit along with the city attorney to make certain that we're doing these in a very timely fashion because again, if I can remove a gun from somebody who's going to do harm, that's one less victim. Thank you. Do many guns or kits come across the border from neighboring states or from Mexico? Not from Mexico. Guns flow the other direction, from us to Mexico. Um, we are the cause of gun violence in Mexico. Um, however, yes, um, the largest uh, ghost gun manufacturer is in Nevada. I um, can't remember the name of the uh, company, but uh, not only do they come across the border from our neighboring states, but they're sold over the internet. Um, you know, Team Enough uh, here in San Diego, it's part of the Brady United organization, they're the youth part. There's a young man uh, named Stephen, who, Stephen, uh, who when he was 17 years old, he worked with Brady nationally to make sure what he was doing was legal. And they videotaped him going on the internet buying the different parts of the gun, using a credit card, having it arrive in the mail. He was 17 years old. There's a very interesting uh, video that got put together about it. And so yes, the problem comes very much from all over. Thank you. We received two or three questions on the same topic. Do police departments or police organizations lobby legislators to pass gun reform laws, such as abolishing assault rifles? 
Yeah, I, I won't, t I'll talk about it more by the associations. Um, so currently, I'll just use myself as an example. I sit on the, the California Chiefs board and I also sit on the major city chiefs board. Um, and so when you started seeing all of the school shootings and all the mass shootings, you saw, for example, major city chiefs write in favor of the red flag laws and different things like that to help control some of this. So um, most chiefs, sheriffs are a little different, elected versus appointed. Um, most chiefs will stay out of the politics of, of opposing or supporting bills just because we need to. And by charter, we're not supposed to do that. Uh, but we can through associations. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll give this one to David. How does a tax on firearms and ammunition limit gun violence? Can't people still just buy them before using them? That's Therese's no, question. Was she's the one who brought that up. <laughs> Sorry. So it's not that the tax will prevent the violence, it's where the money goes from the tax. And so the idea is for that money to create a dedicated fund in the state of California that will fund violence and interruption programs to fight gun violence like the CalDev grant program that the city uh, got last year. So it's having the weapons that cause the harm help fund the solution or the help for the harm that's been caused. Thank you. What accounts for the increased prolif proliferation of guns in San Diego, such as in cars and homes? David, you want to talk about increased sales? I was going to say, uh, increased sales, probably um, one of the big things that just has been talked about is that people, in many cases, legally obtain guns, but if they're not stored properly, there have been many cases where um, people break into a home, the safe is unlocked, and they take the gun. And that is, you know, used in a crime oftentimes. Um, yeah, the other thing is what we've already spoken about too is ghost guns. Uh, very easy to get, literally you can go online on Wednesday afternoon, order it, and it can be in your hands, ready to go by Friday. Uh, if you want to pay the overnight shipping, you can even have it Thursday. Um, I'm glad they began to say that last August that was stopped. Um, and that took a lot of work from a lot of police chiefs. In fact, a lot of us, myself included, went back to ATF headquarters in DC to really kind of try to close that loophole on ghost guns because of the impact that we were seeing. I mean, I could talk for hours about tragic homicides with ghost guns to include murder-suicides of young kids buying a gun and turning around and killing their girlfriend and then killing themselves. I'm realizing I should mention one other ghost gun thing. Um, the federal government closed the ghost gun problem and then the state of California passed a law last year to tighten it down at the state level. And what's happening, however, is there is still a loophole and I don't know if you're seeing this yet in San Diego County, Chief, but uh, we understand that there is um, an increase in um, manufacturing, uh, actually selling the press to people to be able to create the guns, whether that's in the 3D version or in the actual metal version. And so I can't remember the bill number, but there is a bill pending in the state legislature that's really important to close that loophole as well in terms of the uh, actual machines coming in and being sold in the state. Yeah, if I can talk one, one other thing that uh, the federal government has done a really good job of. We've seen quite a few of this. I don't think David's ever reported on this, but it's called the clock switch. Uh, these are being manufactured at homes uh, by using a 3D printer. Uh, they go on the back of a handgun, most, in most cases, a Glock. Uh, that's the most prevalent firearm, the most copied firearm, otherwise known as a Glock switch or a switch that turns a semi-automatic handgun into a fully functioning, fully automatic assault pistol within seconds. Uh, these things cost pennies to make, they sell them for dirt cheap, and you can get those on the internet. Or, sadly, you can find the instructions on the internet. I was just gonna add, I, there was a case, the Escondido case, actually, 
and the police found a 3D printer that was being used to print gun parts, including the switch that the chief was talking about, and that was just discovered in an RV on Saturday. Thank you. Please discuss the relationship between gun violence and mental health services. Who wants to start that one? Well, let's talk first about men. All people who suffer from mental illness are not violent. And in fact, people who suffer from mental illness are at a much higher risk of having becoming victims of violence. That doesn't mean that certain types of mental illness don't lead to violence, they do. But it's, it's we talk about it much too broadly. Um, and mental health services are critical in addressing our gun violence problem. Uh, that's why two of the organizations that the city of San Diego has named as sub-grantees under the CalDIP grant offer mental health services. Uh, Open Heart Leaders, a really good organization in town that serves all over the county um, and largely uh, serving um, the black community and um, other people of color, but not completely, and uh, UPAC, another organization in town. So the mental health services are really important, um, and it's also part and parcel with teaching people how to resolve conflict without resorting to violence. Is there a comment? Um, so briefly, I would just add that oftentimes in, um, when it has to do with shootings in the community, um, I think a lot of groups focus on what they call wrap wraparound services. And so if someone is going to turn their life around, they need the support in various aspects of their lives, including therapy to endure what they just um, went through as a victim of a shooting, as well as job support and so many other resources. So I just, I'm just gonna add that as one aspect to the wraparound. Thank you. Um, this question is for the chief. Should gun manufacturers be held liable for gun deaths? <laughs> that, you know, that, that's really not for me to say. Uh, you know, I don't mean to be it that way, but that's a political ag agreement. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess my question would be cars are used, knives are used, bats are used. Um, and so that, that's really a, a difficult question. I'll go back to, we have laws on the books. Um, in my opinion, we need to do a better job of holding people accountable for violent crime. Um, it's sad when my officers are seeing people who have killed people and back on the street within a matter of years. Um, and so right now, one of the biggest things that we see that is driving violence is a lack of accountability uh, and the belief that they're not gonna be held accountable. Uh, that is the driving in my opinion, be by, between violence and what is going on. I'm not gonna get into the politics of whether somebody should, gun manufacturer should be held liable uh, for that. Oh, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> I understand why you can't, Chief. Um, so, do you know that at the federal level there is a law called PLACA that prevents gun manufacturers from being held liable? So the state of California has done several things to start to deal with this. They passed two different laws last year that started to allow um, liability of gun manufacturers in certain circumstances, including uh, when gun manufacturers are advertising assault weapons, directed, directing that advertising at teens. So it's being worked on as much as we can in the context of the federal law. All right, we are going to wrap it up here today. Thank you very much to our speakers, Carice. <laughs> and and we appreciate your time. And thanks to all of you for coming out today. It was great to see you. We'll hopefully be back here again in the fall. So have a great day.